but I caution you to be very careful with this terminology because it suggests that the problem is intentional or volitional. Because if you are ignoring something, you know that it's there, but you're choosing not to attend to it. And people with neglect, when people have neglect, they are not intentionally ignoring things, but they really are not aware or not fully aware that there are stimuli over on that side. Now, neglect is not a visual deficit. There is nothing wrong with the visual system in somebody who has just neglect. So the visual image is getting from the retina back through the optic nerves all the way back to the occipital lobe where it is processed. But then from the occipital lobe, when that signal is sent forward or anterior in the brain for attentional processing, that's where the problem breaks down. Then some people will suggest, well, you can do cognitive treatment just working on organization and sequencing. And if you can help remediate that problem, then you should also see gains in discourse and language. Uh, the problem is that the gains may not generalize as you hope they will. And using decontextualized, non-meaningful organization and sequencing tasks, you know, organizing things by alphabet or sequencing by shape or size, really are kind of isolated abilities. And just because they can alphabetize better than they did before or sequence things more rapidly doesn't mean that those gains are going to generalize into better organization and sequencing of their thoughts in order to communicate them. So if you want the language to improve, you really want to embed language tasks. So language organization and sequencing in terms of telling stories or explaining procedures. You really want to integrate that in therapy if that's an important goal. Here's another example of a type of elaborative inference called a predictive inference. So if you hear the or read the sentence, Joe put his rod in the car and drove to the lake, most people will infer that Joe is going fishing. So they're predicting that Joe is going fishing. But you don't need to predict that to understand that sentence on its own. Here's another example of an elaborative inference, a tool inference. So you hear Patrick pounded the nail firmly into the wood. He set down his hammer and wiped his brow. So when people get to the word hammer, they very quickly read the word hammer because they expect that he is using a hammer. They infer that he is using a hammer because he pounded a nail and you use a, a hammer to pound a nail. Now, so they have made the elaborative or tool inference. Now, if they hear he pounded the nail firmly into the wood, he set down his screwdriver and wiped his brow. When people get to that word screwdriver, it slows down their comprehension because they hadn't expected it. They had already generated the inference that he was using a hammer. So then when another tool is mentioned, then they have to stop and revise their inference. What we found is that people with right brain damage in general do fine with the bridging inferences or coherence inferences, those that are needed to tie things together. And they are also okay with elaborative inferences when there is a very strong cue that leads you to generate the outcome. So Joe putting his rod in the car and driving to the lake, there really is only one likely outcome or explanation for that, that he is going fishing. And people with right brain damage are able to generate those inferences. They do tend to have difficulty with inference revision. And this occurs when you have an initial idea of what something means and then that interpretation changes. Now this process of inference revision is not completely absent, but it's slow or inefficient, kind of like the suppression process that we previously covered. That is not that they cannot suppress and select the right interpretation, but they're slow at it and that in turn impairs general comprehension.